Hi there. Welcome to our Bible study. We're going to dig into Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 34 today. So what should we expect? Well, Paul is going to be in Athens today. He's going to um, preach in this, this great ancient city. And um, it's, it's going to be kind of interesting because he's going to preach to these philosophical, academic Athenians differently than he would preach to um, Jews or to other Gentiles. And so we kind of get a, a taste today of, of how to preach to the more intellectual, perhaps. Or we also learn that, that we, we talk differently and we preach differently and we, pro we proclaim differently to different kinds of people. Um, so we'll look at verses 16 to 18 first, and we'll see that Paul will reason with people about Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, in verses 19 to 21, the Athenians decide that they want to know more. Uh, then Paul will go and explain how God is different than the Athenian gods. And Paul will proclaim Judgment Day and the resurrection. Many will deny him, but some will follow and become Christians. So in Athens, Paul cannot keep quiet about Jesus Christ. He begins in the synagogue and reasons with the philosophers. His message is intriguing, and soon they invite him to speak in the Areopagus. There, Paul connects God to their culture and philosophy, but goes beyond that and preaches judgment and the resurrection. To these intellectual, Paul becomes an intellectual, and some will follow. Okay? So we learn uh, to, that, that procla a proclamation takes on different and uh, different forms depending on who we're proclaiming to. This is kind of the main lesson today that Paul takes a, a, a break from how he usually preaches because he's preached to a different kind of people. And so he speaks to them differently. We're going to learn that we have to tailor our message to our audience. We also learn uh, that we always must proclaim the resurrection. Even though Paul is talking to this group of intellectuals who are going to hear about the resurrection of the dead and, and, and not believe it, uh, we still have to preach that resurrection because that is the centerpiece of Christianity. That's what it's all about. So let's get into that. Here we got a neat picture of uh, Paul preaching to these Athenians over here. Okay, verses 16 to 18. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So Paul had gone down to Athens to escape from the persecution in Berea, and he was kind of just going to wait in Athens until uh, Timothy and Silas can join him. But he's there, and he sees his spirit is provoked, and he sees that this, this city is full of these foreign gods, and he must do something about it. He feels compelled to preach the gospel to them. So, like Paul... Have you ever felt your spirit provoked? This is something, you know, we, we really should uh, be asking ourselves. And it, it's something that should happen to us now and then. Um, it has happened to me. I don't feel my spirit provoked each and every single day. Um, but it happens sometimes where you just feel like the Holy Spirit is pushing you, urging you, guiding you to do uh, a specific thing. Um, to, to teach to that person, to uh, do, to give to that person over there. I, I, it can come out in a number of different forms, but, you know, here Paul is, he's kind of just thinking, I'm just going to lay low and wait for my friends to arrive. And the Holy Spirit urges him on and says, no, Paul, you're here to preach. And if you're not feeling that, I, I recommend praying to God that, that he would lead you to that, that he would provoke your spirit and, and lead you and guide you into doing his will. And the more we do his will, I think the more God trusts us and the more he does provoke us because he sees that he can rely on us to actually do his work. 
That's just my thought. Would you feel comfortable reasoning with people about the Christian faith? This is something that, you know, Paul does here. He reasons with them. He says, you know, this is why Christianity makes sense. This is one of the incredible things about Christianity is it's not just this religion that you just, just believe it. No, it's a religion that has evidence. It's a religion that fits in history. It's a religion that fits with science. It's a religion that, that makes sense. It is logical. It is reasonable. And uh, I think that's important in our culture today that prides itself on being intellectual and knowledgeable and, and scientific and reasonable, right? Um, so I think we should all learn a little bit about reasoning and how to explain the Christian faith in a reasonable sort of way. Certainly this is not a gift that everyone has, um, but we should all know it to an extent. And I think for those of us that, that do have this gift of, of being able to use reason to bring the gospel to others, we should um, dig into this and, and really learn about the reasonableness of the Christian faith. So if you feel like you have that gift, I challenge you to, to, to use it, to put it to good use, to um, do some research on the Christian faith and, and, and why it's reasonable. i got a quick map for you here. Um, so before, last week Paul was in Philippi and he was also over here in Berea. Um, and he got kicked out of Berea, and he took this, this journey here down to Athens, okay? Um, he was there kind of getting away from the, uh, the mess that had happened in Berea where the Jews uh, got up in arms and things. And so he's down there now, and he's basically just waiting for Timothy and Silas to show up down here in, in Athens. All right, let's dig in. So, Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy in Athens that we talked about, but his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Um, basically, he saw the eternity of everyone around him. They were going to hell, and he had to do something about, us, about it. And I just ask you, if you've ever thought like that, you ever just walked around Walmart, or you know, you're sitting at a stoplight or something, you look around and you see... There's dozens of people around me, and you wonder how many of them are going to hell. I don't know, but it's an interesting thought to have because it's, it's, it's a good thought to have because it's a thought that can spur us on to action and realize that, that eternity is on the line here. This, this isn't just you know, some temporal thing. It's not something that's just going to pass. This is eternity we're talking about right here. This is forever. That person, that person, that person, they're going to spend either forever in heaven or in hell. And God's given us his spirit and he's given us a command and he's given us the tools um, to tell people about him, to bring them the gospel so that they can spend eternity in heaven instead of in hell. God wants everyone to be with him forever in his heavenly home, okay? So don't forget, we should do something about this. What are the gifts that God has given to you? To whom are you close that you, know, you, can, you can evangelize to? This is really important. Like I said, this, is a, this isn't just a matter of life and death. This is a matter of eternal life and eternal death. Okay, take a page out of Paul's playbook here and, and, and go out there and spread the word of God, the gospel, to these people out in our world that need to hear it. Okay, um, so he reasoned in the synagogue and in the marketplace every day. So to both Jews and Gentiles, Paul reasoned with them. Um, he could not sit idly by as people were on the path to hell. So he went and he reasoned with them about God. Paul went out to these people of Athens, people that he cared deeply for because as a, as a Christian, he loved them and he wanted to spend eternity with them. And so he goes to 
them and he tells them the good news about Jesus. But not just the good news, he reasons with them. The Christian faith makes sense, and to these intellectual people, they needed to hear why it makes sense. And so Paul reads with them, he says, look, the world had to get here somehow. Where do you think that came from? It came from God, and I know this God, and this God came to earth, and this God died for your sins, and this God rose from the dead to give you eternal life, right? I mean, that's just one, and a quick one at that, but an example that, that we could use. Don't forget, or, or don't be out there looking for these opportunities to spread the gospel to people. God gives us just even these little opportunities to, to, to spread his word. Don't pass those up. They're so, so, so important, okay? And let's never forget that Christianity makes sense. It's reasonable. Now, this has been a kind of an area of study I've been looking into a lot lately, and it's fascinating. People say, oh, you just have to have faith. No, that's not how God did it. God is a God of logic and reason, and he gives us uh, a, a religion that makes sense, he gives us a religion that was in time, in history. It, 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 it happened here on this earth. Okay? It's reasonable. It makes sense. So I challenge you to do some research on this, to read some books, to read some articles, to read, read some, some websites. Christianity is wonderful because Christianity makes sense. And that's not the only reason. It's wonderful for many reasons. But one of the reasons it's wonderful is that it makes sense. It is reasonable. Okay? Notice also that Paul meets them on their terms. He reasons with them, with these philosophers, with these academics of Athens. You know, he doesn't preach to them as he preaches to the Jews. He preaches differently to both. He meets them on their terms. He tells them what they understand and connects it to their life. And we're going to see a lot more of this as we continue on. Okay? So, um, when Paul is reasoning with them, what does he still preach? Let's back up a little bit here. Um, right? When he is reasoning with them, he is preaching Jesus and the resurrection. <laughs> it's great. Uh, you know, we, we don't throw Jesus out when we're being reasonable. We don't say, well, you know, miracles aren't reasonable, so we're just not going to talk about that. Or rising from the dead isn't reasonable, so we're just not going to talk about that. Right? No, the, the, these things, God has given us reason for them. It, we, there is evidence for the resurrection. And if he could rise from the dead, why couldn't he perform the rest of the miracles, right? The, our faith is entirely and wholly and solely about Jesus and his resurrection. So even when we're reasoning with people, we always need to bring it back to that. That is the meat and potatoes of Christianity. It's all about Jesus and his resurrection, okay? So don't forget to bring in that central message when you're talking to people about God. It's great to reason about evolution or creation or geology or um, the, Moses crossing the Red Sea. I mean, all that stuff is great, but you always have to get it to Jesus. Whenever you evangelize, whenever you tell someone about your faith, it's always about Jesus because our faith is in Jesus. Okay? Um, so, we see that Paul converses and he reasons with all kinds of people. He even, uh, with, the, with the Epicureans and the Stoics, these famous uh, groups of philosophers there in Athens, of course, um, some called him a babbler, some didn't want to hear his message, but others were more willing. Others wanted to hear what he had to say. Others said, yeah, this does make sense. Others said, yes, this is reasonable, okay? Um, and I think it's really important here to keep this in mind right here, that when we proclaim, not everyone will hear your message. People are going to call you bad. Oh, look, listen to that foolish guy over there talking about Jesus, you know. But some will hear you. So we do it anyways, right? Um, think about it. Not everybody listened to Jesus and not everybody listened to Paul. If they didn't listen to Jesus and Paul, there's going to be a lot of people that won't listen to you and me. We're far less good at explaining the gospel than Jesus and Paul. We're far less talented, uh, and we, we, you know, we're not Jesus, right? 
People aren't, not everyone is going to listen to you. But don't let that scare you because some will listen to you. Let me put it to you like this. If you spent your whole life preaching to one person, I'm sorry, preaching to lots of people, but one person came to faith, would that be worth your whole life? Certainly it would, because consider this, okay? Your life is so tiny and minuscule compared to eternity. You have a chance, guys, to let people in on eternity. Of course, it's God working through you, but eternity, forever. You have the chance to plant in someone the seed of eternal life. Even if it takes your whole earthly life to do that, it's worth it. Because this small temporal life is so much less than the hugeness, the vastness of eternity. Think about that. Don't be afraid to go evangelize because people won't listen. You're right, some won't listen. But they didn't listen to Jesus or Paul either. Go do it anyways because it's worth it if even one listens. Okay? And what was Paul preaching? He was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. This is the center of the Christian message. Even though he's reasoning, he reasons about the things that are central. He reasons about Jesus. This is what we have faith in, guys. The Christian faith is in the fact that God became man, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross, that his death was our propitiation, our justification, that it forgave the sins of the whole world, and that then he rose from the dead to give eternal life to all believers. That's what we have faith in. That's what we trust in. That's what it's all about. So Paul makes sure that he is teaching all about this central message, the fact uh, that Jesus came and died and rose, and that now we have forgiveness and eternal life. Okay? However we're going to reach people, we always must include this message. It's the central message of Christianity. It must be in there. Okay? Also keep this in mind then. So Jesus makes sense, and the resurrection makes sense. This isn't something that we just blindly accept and believe. This is something that makes sense. It is reasonable, as it says. It's wonderful. Okay, moving on. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Okay, so... Um, they describe the Christian message as strange. Could it be described as strange? I think the answer is yes. And I think this is a great proof for Christianity is that um, it's different. No other religion is like this. It is strange. It is strange that God is three in one. It is strange that God became a man. It is strange that God died for his creation. The creator died for his creation. It is strange that we can't do anything to earn heaven. These things are strange. They're so strange that nobody could have ever made them up. They're so strange they must be true. That's what I think. Who would have made up any of those things? They're ridiculous. They're strange. They're a mystery as the Bible calls them. But... They also make total and perfect sense. You know, it, it just, if everything fits, the whole Christian worldview makes sense. It all fits together. It's wonderful. But nobody would have made it up. It's strange. But it's strange in such a beautiful way. Because its strangeness, I think, helps to prove its truth. Nobody could have made this up. If someone asked you to tell them about your faith... Would you be prepared right then and there to do it? We, we see that Paul is here. I think you need to ask yourself this question. If someone just came up to you and asked you to share your faith with them, would you be ready? We should always be ready to spread the gospel. And when God gives us a golden opportunity, like somebody asking us a question about it, we better be prepared. I can tell you, I haven't always been. I have not always been prepared to give a good answer to people. But I'm studying now, and I'm getting better at it. And we're going to fall short. When we fall short, don't forget we have forgiveness. But 
Do be prepared to share your faith with people. Think of what you would say. Think of how you would answer certain challenges and questions. Do some research. Read some books. There's really great books out there on all this stuff. I challenge you to do that. Okay. Some wanted to know more about Paul's message. So they brought him to the Areopagus, okay? This is the part of the city where the religious matters were discussed. Um, so the Areopagus was a specific area in Athens um, that you know, there, was, there was certain um, things that, that were discussed there that um, I, I found a list and I can't, I can't see it in my notes right now. Um, oh, here it is. Um, in classical times, it functioned as the court for trying deliberate homicide, wounding, and religious matters, as well as cases involving arson or olive trees. There you have it. So they had this specific court for you know that was just for these things, and one of them was religious matters. So since Paul is talking about religion, he goes, they bring him to the Areopagus so he can talk in front of these people, these deep thinkers, um, and, and explain the Christian religion to them. So, our goal here, and what we can learn, is to be ready to tell others uh, your faith when they ask. The great hope is that people will see you living your life differently. People will see you doing things in question. Why are they doing that? And then when they ask you, if they ask you, when they ask you, then we have that golden opportunity from God to tell them about our faith, to tell them we're doing this because God tells me to. We're doing this because God did it for me first. I'm doing this because I want to do this, to serve others because God has served me. Okay? Paul said, or they, they say, you bring some strange things to our ears, right? We did talk about already how Christianity is unique. It's different. It's the sort of thing you couldn't make up. And that's the words of actually C.S. Lewis that I love those. I love those words. Um, it's so unique you couldn't make it up. I think it's a wonderful proof that Christianity is the truth. Okay, so we see their curiosity um, got the best of them. They they wish to know what these things mean. You know, these things um, being what what Paul is talking about the Christian faith and and what it means is that we're all sinners, we're all in need of a savior, and that God died on a cross, and rose from the dead to be that Savior. That's what these things mean. The, and be, these things, those things right there, mean that we have eternal life in heaven, in paradise, because of what God did. It's beautiful. It truly is beautiful. Okay. Moving on to the next section. Um, so, Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said... Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should see God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even... Uh, some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Okay, how does Paul connect Christianity to them? In so many ways. Paul does this incredible thing. It becomes about them. Paul's preaching is connected to them and their life. And when they're like, hey, he's talking about me. Hey, this fits in with this and this. this. I understand this. Then he gives them the gospel, but he connects it first. Let's take a look at a few of the ways that he connects it. Okay, Men of Athens, he addresses them. He perceives they are very religious. For as he passed along, he, ob he observed the objects of your worship, right? Their worship. And I also found an altar 
with this inscription, to the unknown God. So then Paul connects it to them. Therefore, what you therefore worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Okay? Paul connects it to them. He says, you already have this concept in your mind. Here is the answer to the concept. Here's the fulfillment of that concept. Okay? Then Paul says, the God who made the world and everything in it. Okay? Right? He says, look around you. How'd this get here? I have the answer. I'll tell you how it got here. Okay? He, if, if he really created this whole earth, do you think he lives in temples made by man? Absolutely not. He's way too big for that. Okay? Paul is connecting it. He's, he's giving them uh, logical things to think about. Okay? Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Why would the God that created everything need anything? Everything is already his. So he's being very logical and reasonable, reasonable with them, right? He gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. We can't give back to him what's already his, right? He's being so logical and reasonable to, to, to fit with their philosophical mindset, okay? And he then explains how we got here. He says, hey, you guys exist. How, did you, how do you think you got here? Well, I have the answer. God made you from one man, okay? Every nation of mankind live on the face of the earth. And having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of a dwelling place, that they should seek God, right? So God, he's basically saying, you guys believe in fate. You believe you have a purpose. Where does your purpose come from if not from God? Look at it, it comes right from God. If, there, if there's no God, you have no purpose, but you know you have a purpose, therefore there must be God. Let me tell you about that God. And what is the purpose? The purpose is that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Okay? And he, then he says, even your own poets understand this. Even your own poets understand that we come from God and that we, we have our purpose and our, our being from him. Even we, we come from him. Okay? In so many ways. Paul connects Christianity to them. And what a lesson we can learn when we're preaching, when we're evangelizing and proclaiming. Connect it to your people. How does it apply to them? It's wonderful how Paul gets this across. And we need to do this too. This is very, very important. Okay. So uh, we'll go through this kind of quickly here because I've kind of already talked about it. But he says, Men of Athens... Ah, uh, you are very religious. Paul connects it to them, right? He calls them out by name, men of Athens. Uh, he notices that they're religious, and he has a new religion to tell them about. Of course, this is a true religion, okay? So what he's going to do is he's going to start out by saying, you're religious. I see it. I see all of your altars and all of your um, statues and temples, right? You're religious, but then he's going to say, but think about your religion, okay? Think about it. If, if the gods that you worship live in those temples and are those statues, how did this world get here? How does that actually give you a purpose? If, if, if your god is, is inside that temple or is that statue, it's a pretty small god. Does that god even need you? Why do you bring sacrifices to that God? You're religious, you do these things, but it doesn't make any sense. Logically, reasonably, it doesn't make any sense. So, Paul's going to say in the next section, right, let me tell you about the God who does make sense. Let me tell you about the God who doesn't dwell in temples, because he's way too big for that. Let me tell you about the God who is so big that he creates the whole world, the whole universe. Let me tell you about the God who really does give you purpose. Let me tell you about the God who doesn't require sacrifice. Because what would our sacrifices do for him? He creates everything. Everything is his, right? It's incredible. The, 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 the line of logic Paul uses here. He connects it to them. He explains why they're wrong. And then he's going to explain why he's right, why God is right, why Christianity is indeed the true religion. It makes sense. Okay? So he noticed all their objects of worship, right? Uh, that we can learn from this that he paid attention to them and he spoke to them. Okay? Sometimes the first part of evangelizing, most of the time, 
is listening, is hearing what they have to say, hearing where they're at, and then you can um, tailor your message to fit them. And they're going to be much more willing to hear it, right? That's exactly what Paul does. He walks from the city. He understands who they are as a people. So now he can tailor their message to them, okay? Don't forget this all-important part of evangelism, that we have to... to um, to, to learn about those we're evangelizing to so that we are able to better evangelize them. Because they're going to listen when we are like them, when we understand them, when we pay attention to them. Okay. Um, one obvious he noticed was this altar to the unknown God. And so he's, he says, you know, you already understand there's got to be something bigger out there. You guys already get it. You already know there's something bigger than this statue of Athena and this temple. This, you know, they have the great big Parthenon in Athena in Athens, but come on, you know there's more than this. You do know it. You even have an altar to this God. You just don't know who he is. But let me tell you about him. You know, that's what Paul's going to get to, right? So, again, I can't say it enough. Learn to listen so that you understand. And then connect your message to their life. And then when you have that connection, bring in the gospel, bring in Jesus Christ and the resurrection, which is what Paul is going to do exactly. And we'll see that. Okay. Um, so Paul says, what you already worship is unknown. This is what I'm going to tell you about. Okay. Um, this is his path by which he's going to preach to them. So again, let's learn from this, right? He found a way in. He found something. They're going to listen to me if I talk about them. They're going to listen to me if I connect it to them. They're going to listen to me if I explain that I, I understand that they already worship this God. They already know him. I'm sorry, they already, they already know he exists. But now I'm going to tell them about him so that they really can know him. Okay? So, this is the God who made the world. The Lord of heaven and earth. Okay? They knew there must be a creator. They knew that this unknown creator God existed. Paul tells them, I know that God. Okay? So he makes it very clear that their gods are false and that this God is true, right? Remember a few verses ago that he was taken aback by all of the idols in the city. So first, he also has to kind of refute their religion and say, yeah, all these idols, guys, they're wrong, they're bad, not good. But I'm going to tell you about the true God, the, the God that is way bigger than stone and temples. Uh, he, we can't even fathom him, okay? It, he is so huge that he does not live in temples made by man. Okay? What is one purpose of our lives according to this passage? Let's back up a little bit here. What is one purpose of our lives? Well, I think that that purpose, and this is probably the most important purpose of our life, is to seek God and perhaps feel your way toward him and find him. Okay, right? The, the only thing that ultimately matters is getting eternal life. How do we get eternal life? By faith in God, by trusting that he sent his son to the world, that his son lived the perfect life, that he still died on a cross to forgive our sins, and that he rose meant to give us a resurrection from the dead also. This is what Christianity is all about. That's it. That's the meat and potatoes of it right there. So, the only purpose that we have, really, is to, I'm sorry, the, the most important purpose that we have is to have faith. Because this life is really just about getting to the next life, the eternal, the perfect, okay? Now, the other big purpose that we have, of course, is when we have fulfilled this purpose, when we have uh, found God, or when, rather, when God has found us, uh, then we tell others about this. That's our other great purpose that we have. Okay. Paul says, This God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, right? He is so big. He doesn't need our sacrifices. He doesn't need what we offer to him. What we offer is so much less than him, right? And this makes total and complete sense. Paul is saying, what well, you worship, this is dumb. This doesn't make any sense. You're reasonable people. How can you think that you could ever do anything for God? 
if God created everything, in, including you, how can you do anything for him? He can do whatever he wants. He's all-powerful. He's not served by you, yet you serve these pieces of stone and wood and gold. That's foolish. Let me tell you about the, the, the real God, the one who really did create all this, the one who really did create you. You can't serve him, and that makes sense, okay? Um, this is also is really beautifully brought out in Psalm 50. I don't have time to read it, but if you get a chance, read Psalm 50. It talks about this. It's, it's really incredible. Um, so everything, God is everything. God has everything, and all we have is a gift from him. Don't ever forget this, that, that everything we have is really just a gift from God. So it's not actually our stuff. It's God's stuff, and we're the stewards of it. Okay. God made from one man every nation, right? He created the whole world, and he also created you. So Paul first says, you know, we have this God who created everything. Oh, and by the way, you exist too. How did you get here? Well, do you think that piece of stone created you? No, you created that piece of stone. You chiseled it and made it look pretty, right? That stone didn't create you. That quote-unquote God didn't create you. Let me tell you about the God who did create you, who created humanity, mankind, okay? Um, and, and this God that has determined the allotted periods and boundaries of our dwelling place, okay? And I see this as kind of an argument for providence, right? I'm sorry, not providence, for purpose, right? God has given us purpose, and we feel that purpose, right? All of us, all of our life, we're searching for purpose, okay? That's why we have careers, and that's why we, you know, do have, you know, friends. And the, I'm not saying that's the only reason, but um, we, we're always searching for purpose in our lives, always searching for purpose. And, and we, we, we have this desire to have purpose, but we, we can't find it outside of God. So the fact that we have this desire for purpose really is evidence for God, because if there, if there, was no God, there would be no sense of purpose. But we have this as a purpose. We know there's something bigger. We know there's something more important. We know intuitively then that God must exist, right? So he's again talking to these academics, these philosophers, and saying uh, it's it's obvious by this, this idea of purpose that you feel that God does exist. And let me tell you about that God, he's going to say, okay? Our purpose is this, that we should seek God and feel uh, their way toward him and find him. Okay? We recognize there must be a creator. There must be an orderer. There must be this one who gives purpose. Um, God makes this clear so that we seek him. Okay? We, as it says in the letter to the Romans, we can know that God must exist. We can't know about Jesus without the Bible. Okay? But we can understand just intuitively that God exists because this world exists, the universe exists. We have purpose, we have, we're provided for, etc., right? So because he's left these clues, our goal is to seek God, to feel our way towards him and find him. And when we've found God, then we've found eternal life. And our purpose is complete. Our ultimate purpose is fulfilled that, that we then you know, have faith in that God, and we then have eternal life. We have the one thing that is beyond this life. Okay? Then he also uh, connects it back to the man, because their poets wrote these very words, okay? This is something that they did. Their poets wrote that, okay? And Paul says, you guys know this intuitively. There must be a God. Let me tell you about him. Okay, and that's what he gets into next here. So, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the arts and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, 
we will hear about this tomorrow. Again, tomorrow. Uh, not, that's not in there. So Paul went out from their midst, but some joined him and believed, among whom were also Dionysius, uh, the Aeropagite, and a woman named Dam Damaris, and others with them. Okay. So, what impetus has God given us to repent? Okay. The impetus he's given to us, uh, given to us to help us to repent is that he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. Okay. Judgment day is coming. There's going to be the sheep and the goats, the ones that go to heaven, the ones that go to hell. If this isn't a reason to repent of your sins, I don't know what is. Right? The, the idea that if I don't repent, I am going to hell. Right? So repent. God has given us every reason to repent. He's been very, very good to us. And we know that when we repent, we receive his forgiveness so that we don't go to hell on judgment day. Instead, we'll go to the new creation and live eternally in paradise. What a good reason to repent. Um, what great proof has God given us for his message? Well, Paul explains it right here. Um, he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. And of this, he has given assurance or proof to all by raising him from the dead. The great proof of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? Because if somebody could rise from the dead on their own power, they indeed must be God. If they are God, then indeed we better listen to them, to him. Okay? And this guy who proved that he was God by rising from the dead says there's going to be a judgment day. And he says, repent. And he says, believe in me. He says these things that so we, we better do them. We don't want to ignore God, the one who rose from the dead, the one who proved he was God by overcoming death. Okay. Being God's offspring, okay, um, it, it, it is plain he's saying that we came from God. Even your poets see this. We kind of talked about that uh, in the in the last uh, last slide, right? So don't think of God as an image formed by the art or imagination of man. We're higher than that. So our cre creator must be even higher than us. What he's saying is, guys, you made these idols. You made them out of your hands. You formed them by your art and your imagination. <laughs> what, what we make is lower than us, is lesser than us. You were able to do this. That would make you God over that idol. Okay? That, that idol should not be God over us. Instead, there must be then a God that is over us, a God that did form us, a God that did create us, and, and that a God that, that did beget us, and now we are his offspring, okay? Again, he's being very logical and reasonable with them, saying what you do doesn't actually make sense, but I'm going to tell you what does make sense, okay? And of course, you know, we don't worship these same idols today, but we do worship idols. We do worship money or sex or family or vacations or experiences or careers, um, you know, we do, we do put our, our life and our energy behind these things and make them our highest priority. And when we do that, we're worshiping those things. And yet they, they're made by us. Careers are, are made, you know, by us. We get those careers. A family, right? I mean, that's also made by God, but, um, it's, it's something that is, is, is human-like, right? Uh, all of these different things. They're, they're things that are lower. They're not greater. They're not something that we should worship. We should only worship the one true God, the one that made everything, the one that made us, right? If something made us, then we should naturally worship it. 
And the one who made us is God. So let's worship him. Um, Paul says, the times of ignorance God overlooked. Okay, there are a few parallels to this in the Bible, such as right here in Romans 3.25. And we don't entirely understand what happened to unbelievers before Christ. But now it, it is certain what's going to happen to believers and unbelievers, right? Um, so I don't want to get into, you know, what happened to people before you know, Christ came. We do know from the New Testament um, that faith um, still saved, right? The faith of Abraham is, a, is an example that's used in Romans and Hebrews, right? There's many others. These people that had faith in God, that had faith in his promise, most of the promise of a Messiah, right? They are saved, but it also appears like those who didn't have faith, they were in ignorance, right? It appears that God overlooked. So I, I don't exactly know what that means. I don't want to get into it too much right now. But we do have this actually, again, like in a, in a few places in Scripture, including here in Romans 3.25. Um, but, you know, what really is important is that now we do know what's going on. Now we understand. Now we know what happens to believers and unbelievers. Now we know that believers go to heaven and that unbelievers go to hell. And so now we, there's no more ignorance. We know the outcome. So we live our life for God then. We live our life trying to get the outcome of more people to be in heaven instead of in hell. So what do we do? Well, Paul tells them, you know, God commands all people everywhere to repent. Okay, now it's for everyone. It's not just for the Jews anymore. This is for everybody. God's not overlooking things anymore. He's not where there is no more ignorance. He has revealed himself. He has come to earth and he has given us his word, okay? So, we have this command to repent. What is repentance? Repentance is saying, I'm sorry. But it's more than that. It's also turning from your sins, okay? When we repent, we're saying, God, I'm really sorry I did that and I don't want to do it anymore. And we try not to do it anymore. With his help, he helps us do that. He gives us his Holy Spirit to help us lead this sanctified life, Okay? Repentance is so important because repentance is the humility that we, we need to feel in order to receive God's forgiveness. Um, we repent and then we receive forgiveness. If, if, we, if we don't feel like, if we don't repent, we don't feel like we need to repent. And that's a problem because we, we don't recognize then that we are simple people. This is the, the, the first use of the law, right? The, the, God gives us the law to show us you are sinful. You have messed up. You have done things wrong. Now that you understand that, repent. And here's the gospel. But for those of us, for, for not those of us, for, for people out there that, that don't repent, they don't think they need God. They reject God. And then they don't have God. Okay, God says, if, if you want to do it your way, fine, do it your way. But you're not going to heaven. Okay, so repentance is very important. And repentance is an attitude of humility. Okay, let us repent of our sins and turn to God for forgiveness, right? And that's what faith is, right? That turning to God and saying, God, I really trust that you're going to forgive my sins. Okay, so... Paul gets at the heart of it all now, okay? He has spent all this time connecting it to them, bringing it to them, helping them see the, the logical fallacies of their own religion and showing them that he has the logical and reasonable faith. And now he gets to the meat of it. Now that he says, you know, you see now why you're wrong and why this is right? Well, let me tell you what this is now. Let me explain this to you. This is repentance. This is going to be forgiveness. Okay? So Paul uses his logic and his reason to get them to the point now where he can tell them law and gospel. Where he can tell them they need a Savior, they're sinners need a Savior, and hey, we have this Savior. It's wonderful. Okay? Why should we repent? Because God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world. Okay, you'll be guilty or innocent. Uh, right? Remember, remember Paul's in the Areopagus right now, which is the, it's, it's a court in Athens, right? This is where people are declared guilty or innocent. 
God's going to come as this great judge on the earth on the final day, and he is going to declare some guilty and some innocent. How do you become innocent? Nothing you can do. All it is is repent, like he said, and you receive that forgiveness in faith. And then you're innocent. It's wonderful. What a message we have, really. Okay, Paul says, you know, how, how do we know this is all true? Well, he's given us assurance by raising him from the dead. How can we know that Christianity is true? Well, we know Christianity is true because of the resurrection. Because if somebody rose from the dead, they must be God. And if they're God, well, then we better submit, we better be humble, we better repent, we better listen, we better do what he says. Okay, and he says to us, I have done it all. You repent in humility and receive my forgiveness. And I'm going to even help you repent, God says. It's incredible. Um, so, God proved his message, he proved his plan, and he proved himself by an act that only God could do. The resurrection of Jesus, right? Again, if, if anybody else could rise from the dead, then they might have some claim to be God. But nobody else can do that. Nobody else has done that. Nobody else will do that. It's something only God can do. And by him rising, it confirms who he is. It confirms that his message is true. Because in his resurrection, it confirms to us that he really has defeated death. So we'll get a resurrection too. It confirms his plan. It confirms that, you know, Jesus really is the Messiah. And it confirms himself. It says, I am God. Look what I did. Look at my works and believe that I am God. So because of the resurrection, we believe in Jesus. No one but God could have done that. And since he is God, we better believe what he says. Okay? We've been talking about this over and over again. But it's pretty clear. Because of the resurrection, we believe in Jesus. No one but God could have risen from the dead. Since he is God, we better listen to him, we better believe in him, okay? Yet, at this message of the resurrection, some mocked, but some wanted to hear more, and some men joined him and believed, okay? Like we said in the beginning, when we proclaim Jesus, not everyone is going to like our message. Not everyone is going to listen. Not everybody is going to want to hear it. Not everybody is going to believe it, but some will. And so we do it for those some. We do it for the some that wanted to hear more, for the some that joined him and believed because, like I said earlier, giving your whole life for this one cause, for one person to come to faith is totally worth it because your temporal life is so much less than their eternal life, right? And you get eternal life too. It's not like it deprives you of it, okay? So we're, we're playing here, guys, in this life with this game of, of eternal life and death. The stakes are eternally, infinitely high. Let that motivate you to proclaim to people. Let that motivate you to listen to them, to figure out where they're at, to figure out how to connect your message, the message of the gospel, to them so that they want to hear, so that they will listen. And then, how to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. That the Spirit will be working faith in their hearts. And they, too, will receive eternal life. That's what we're here for. We're here to seek God when we have found God, when He's found us. Then our secondary purpose is to proclaim him to others, just like Paul does right here. And he gives us a truly incredible example of how to do that, doesn't he? He really does. All right, so let's continue to preach it for those who will believe. Let's not worry about the ones who don't, but let's preach it for the ones who will. Let's close with a prayer. Dear God, Thank you for this word today. Thank you for teaching us. Lord, I ask that you'd please help us to be like Paul. Please provoke our spirits and give us guidance and, and leadership on, on how you want us to evangelize and to whom and when, Lord. Give us the courage and the strength to be out there like Paul, 
doing these things. Lord, um, we ask that, that you would please um, work through us then to bring others to faith, that they may spend eternity with you. Lord, please help us to be your um, missionaries, to be your proclaimers, to be your evangelizers, God. Please help us with that. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you all very much for watching. It's been a pleasure. I hope you have a wonderful day today. And God's blessings be upon you.